this now. All right, let me go back to share the screen. And here we are. All right, so we ended out with Augustine of Hippo. So now we're going to we're going to take this and we're going to go to the Reformation. Um, so now, so now our, our journey goes, we, we kind of go from the early church to now the Reformation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let me begin. This is during the time of the pre-modern era, uh, before, the sci before science, and most knowledge was contained in the church. And so you were, you know, the knowledge was locked into the church. And so um, it was relational. Um, and so truth was, um, was, was the, is the correspondence of appearance and reality. Um, and so it, it, an individual carries community consciousness within the self. Individuals represent the community. Uh, so again, this was a time before the scientific method. Uh, the Reformation was a time when the Bible was placed in the hands of the common people. So uh, during the medieval period, there was a time when the Bible, when the, when the Catholic Church had control of the, the scriptures. And so when you went to a Catholic church during that time, mass was done in Latin, the sermons were done in Latin. Um, so people really didn't have a real genuine understanding of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Preaching was scant. Um, you know, and most times if people un people were communicating what the church said, not what the Bible said. <clears throat> that, that, one of the things I want to be I, I want to share this, and, and that leads to this application that we have to be careful that we're not just saying what our pastor said. Now, I want people, when people come to the People's Baptist Church and they join or whatever, you know, I want them to know the scripture, you know, because that's, because at the end of the day, what I, what I say has no, and it has no value if it's not under the authority of scripture. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, and so the ordinary people could not, un, could, did not have access to the, to the message. Um, however, um, there came a time and one notable preacher, you, you probably have already heard of him as Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. uh, you have already heard of Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. Um, this is him. Um, the period of the of Reformation brought about the emergence of notable preachers and uh, of, of a notable preacher and theologian named Martin Luther. He sought to remind people that the Word of God is central to the life of the church. Now we can't survey everything that he did. However, there are some things to him that we need to. That's important for us to know. All right, that. Yet Luther was also a pro preacher and a prolific one at that. From the beginning of his ministry in 1512 to his death in 1546, listen at this, he preached over 4,000 sermons. Mm. Even in years when his health was bad, Luther would often preach nearly 200 times. That's a mm. lot of preaching. Mm -hmm. Um. Let me feel bad. I'm going, uh, listen, uh, yeah. Uh, generally, he <laughs> averaged three sermons per week throughout his adult life, mm. but often preached four or more, or preached four or more. Luther was, to state it mildly, a huge, a hom homiletical genius. Mm. That's a lot of preaching. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I found this part in, when I did my when I was doing my reading. I found this to be so hilarious. There were moments when Martin Luther uh, thought that his own preaching did not have the desired impact. 
So while he was pastoring in Wittenberg, Germany, which is in Germany, he became frustrated because the church was living was not living according to the gospel at times. There was a time when he told them, there was a time that Martin Luther told the people, I'm tired of preaching to y'all. And he actually went on strike <laughs> because people didn't give him attention. He said, I'm not preaching. Now what? Now now in the, now let me talk about. Uh, I'm going on strike from my church for a couple of Sundays. Y'all not listening to me? I'm not preaching. Oh my goodness! Uh, they'll say, "Okay, we we not paying you either." So whatever, <laughs> you go on strike. Go ahead, go, go on strike. We not gonna pay you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that church that worked for him. That ain't gonna work for pastor and black people. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, that ain't gonna work. No, no. That's the <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, um, yet he had a wonderful way of taking language and adapting it to the language to the audience he was preaching to. For Luther, it was imperative that we ensured that our preaching wasn't so lofty that the common people was able to reach. Mm. We must always consider that we are not preaching to seminary trained keepers in our congregation. Therefore, we must make the Bible, we must take the Bible and make it live in the human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't preaching to seminary trained people. All the, he was preaching to peasants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes these people weren't living worth nothing. Mm -hmm. However, you know, he still strove to preach the gospel to them. Mm -hmm. If if preach if you if 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 there's nothing else you've gotten to, from the night's lesson, the priest, the, the two things I want you to get out of here. And first of all, and that number one is this. Preach what the Bible means. Number two, make it plain. All right. If you haven't got anything thus far, preach what it means, make it plain. Those are two points I want to make clear. All right. There's another character, John Calvin. This is John Calvin. He was another, another reformer was John Calvin. He lived between 1509 and 1564. He was trained as a lawyer. One of his greatest contribution was systematizing the systematizing of theology. It was his conviction that God was an orderly God. Therefore, he sought to give structure to theology. He had a high view of the Bible, which led to a high priority placed on preaching. He could be described as one who fostered the idea of exposition. He believed that the true church can be determined when the gospel is rightly preached and the sacraments rightly observed. So he had a, he had a big view on the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because he had a big view on the Bible, preaching was priority. All right. Mm -hmm. So if there's another lesson you can get from him, again, you, we don't have, always have to agree with everything with, with, with theologians. I don't agree with everything with John Calvin. My goal was not to get you to agree, but there's one thing that I want to bring out of this. Preaching has priority. Preaching is priority. Um, I was uh, talking to one of my members at one time. And they were talking about, oh, you know, Pastor, there are other methods that's more effective than preaching. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Preaching, in my estimation, is highly effective and is a priority. That is the chief aim by which Jesus draws people into the church. Praise dancing is good. Singing is good. I ain't got nothing against it but it never takes the place of preaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's my conviction. Any thoughts on that? Any thoughts? 
I have to agree with you. Yeah. 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 Um, God. Yeah. yeah. What do you What do you think about the times when people don't preach because they said that the Holy Spirit is moving? <laughs> I have my convictions about that, and um, you know, I understand that the Spirit does move, but I also understand that people need instruction from the mm -hmm. word of God. Um, yeah, people need to hear, yeah, people need to experience the spirit, but people need to sit there behind in the pew and, and get the word. <laughs> because the problem with church, and, I, and, I'm, and this is, y'all, forgive me, because, you know, as I'm going to share what I'm going to share. But the problem with folk is that sometimes we shout so much, we crying so much, we doing all this whooping and hollering, squall percolating and boiling, Mm -hmm. and there's no word and mm -hmm. and we have all this experience but no change mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. scripture says that people will not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of god faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I again i'm I, and possibly because I have not experienced that. Um, mm -hmm. There may be those who may have experienced my, my that. IPod, there may be those who have experienced that, that type of a moment when they the spirit was so high that they couldn't preach. I've never had that moment. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every moment that, every, every Sunday, I don't care how you shout. I don't care how long you shout. Mm -hmm. You can shout all Sunday. You can fall out, roll on the floor, do all you want. But before you leave there, I'm going to give you a word. It won't be a long word. Right. Because I'm going to exercise wisdom. Right. But it's going to be the word. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, 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 I don't know. Preaching is important. Mm -hmm. And for us to not take that in. To, I, again, I get it. People do what they want, and some people will do will disagree with me, and that's that's okay. Um, but that's my conviction. Preaching is priority in the life of the church, and I don't care how much of an experience you have. Before you leave there, you can do all the crying you want. Before you before you leave that church, I'm gonna give you something to hold you because the word will hold you in the shout camp. Mm -hmm. uh, the dance ain't always gonna hold you. Tears ain't, ain't always gonna hold you. the word will. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that, that's you know. Yeah, you know, who am I? <laughs> um the evidence of his uh of his life spent expounding God's word as a he was a uh John Calvin was a senior minister of Geneva. He preached twice each Sunday and every weekday on alternating weeks from 1549 until his death in he did a lot of preaching. 1554. Mm -hmm. He preached over 2,000 sermons from the old testament alone. He spent mm -hmm. a year expounding. Espositing Job and three years in Isaiah. In oh. addition, into his preaching were lectures on the Bible that led to the biblical commentaries. Now, this sounds very good, and, and people back then could handle that. Mm -hmm. In our congregations today, you got to be wise. You know, yeah. for me to spend 12 ye two years in the New Testament or in Old Testament. Uh, it's a bit much, so you got to balance the diet. Preaching requires balancing the diet. That worked for him. That ain't going to work for us. Just like preaching two hours or an hour or 45 minutes uh, don't work for my people. <laughs> that's why each of you are going to you're going to preach a sermon that's going to be 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. you know, preach a sermon of 25 minutes. 25 mm. minutes, 25. Someone said, well, I, that's, that's a sermonette. Well, mm -hmm. uh, if you can't say it in 25 minutes, it don't need to be said. And yeah, that's my, that's been my theory, you know? Um, yeah. So 
That's John Calvin. So we move to the modern period. Um, and there is, uh, the modern period was more of a scientific period. This is when people began to really were, they were less dependent on the church mm -hmm. and more dependent on scientific methods. What can be, what could be proven. Mm -hmm. And even now, if it is, if it isn't proven, it's, it ain't true for some people. A lot of people have gone, got, gotten away from church. Mm -hmm. Because to them, a lot of things cannot be proven mm -hmm. to them now, not the case. Mm -hmm. So this shapes the way preaching has evolved. So um, during the scientific advancement, preaching also continued to thrive. Um, a group will be, there'll be a few groups that it will be noted during this time. One of those groups are the Puritans. You wanna put that note that the Puritans who were preachers. So central was preaching that many of them placed the pulpit to the cent in the central church. So, you know, have you ever thought about this? That if you go into a Catholic church, many times the pulpit is off to the side. And in the middle, there is the table. The ta table is exalted. That is because the Eucharist or communion is the central act of worship. But if you go to like, if you go to a Baptist church, some Baptist churches, uh, in particularly my in people's, the pulpit is elevated above the table yeah. because preaching is priority in the life of the church. It doesn't demean the table. The table is definitely important, uh, but preaching is priority. Uh, I don't think we take into consideration how, how, um, how preaching has priority in the life of the church and how sometimes the way we structure our churches reflect such. So, uh, Thomas Long talked about, so the Puritans developed a style called the plain, the Puritan plain style of preaching. As the term plain implies, this approach to preaching is simple and to the point. The purpose of this style is to help the congregation encounter the gospel as directly as possible. The plain style has been and is used by preachers in several theological movements. Um, I don't encourage that because it's the boring style. You know, uh -huh. uh, plain style preaching is not a, you know, again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just surveying. I, I just want you to see what was going on throughout church history. I don't want you to go using a lot of this stuff because a lot of this stuff will not work in an African-American congregation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so again, in, the, in, in this style, there was the exposition of the text, of a biblical text, doctrine and practice or topic. The preacher gives a brief exegesis of the text, gives a doctrine or practice or other topic. When, when turning to theological analysis, the sermon reflects on the, the theological, on the claim of the text. So there's the exegesis of the text, then they would move to the claim of the text. All right, and then they would move to, how does this apply in our life? Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. So they would talk about the biblical text. Then they would talk about, okay, what is this text? What is the major theme of this text? And then how does it apply to my life? That's mm -hmm. the simple form of that text. So it's a, it's, what does it mean? What's the big idea? Okay, how do I apply it? So what? All right. Any questions on that? Or any other methods at this point? Okay. All right. Now there's there's a we, we move to a time called the Great Awakening. 
uh, the Great Awakening. Um, this was during the time when um, this period uh, lasted from 1720 until the 1740s. Uh, during this time, the, there was a great stress on conversion. You just couldn't go to church just because you, you know, you wanted to go to church. There would, there would have to be an inner conversion. You had to really know the Lord. Um, that, that was what, that was the stress of that time. Um, and this, it, it appealed to the emotion. That's why a lot of African-Americans, um, so you talk about Jonathan Edwards, you know, his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you know, that it, it was um, a statement would be if you got that old time religion, you ought to show some sign. Y'all ever heard that statement before? Um, you know, if you got religion, you ought to show some sign. This mm -hmm. was what the Great Awakening was all about. It was like, listen, um, if you got religion, you ought to show some sign. Mm. All right. It, 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 all, it was. Hey, show that you've been saved. Mm. All right. Mm. All right. Now we talked about all that. Let's talk about some the influence of black preaching. All right. We done talked about all these folk, and that's great. But now I want to get to the influence of black preachers. Because at the end of the day, Black preaching has played an enormous role in the development of preaching. John Calvin is good. Martin Luther is good. Jonathan Edwards is good. Origin is good. All of them folk are good. But let's talk about preachers in our own tradition. So the first one up is the Reverend John Jasper. Um, this is what he looks like. This is John Jasper. All right. He was born in Virginia, uh, Virginia uh, in the Slovenian County in 1812. His father was a preacher, but died before his birth. He worked in a tobacco company and he married twice. His first one didn't last because the slave master did not allow him to visit his wife. So for five years after his marriage, he lived in a state of rebellion. Um, however, after those five years, he was converted and called to preach. He did remarry. His ministry can be described in this way. All right. He began preaching immediately after baptism. And his first sermon was ex were extremely well received. He served as supply pastor for several churches. In 1867, soon after the Civil War, at almost 55 years old, he organized the Sixth Mount Zion Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, with a congregation of nine members. He served there for 33 years, and the membership grew uh, to many hundreds requiring a major reconstruction of the church building. So, and one of his most famous sermons is came out of Joshua, the sun do move. And I'm going to, if I can find it, if I can get a PDF copy of it, I think I can. I'm gonna try to post it to, um, I'm gonna try to post it to our classroom. And so, or uh, I'll try to post it to the classroom for you. So that way you can get a hold of it. But that, that, that was a famous sermon. The sun do move. Uh, many have dismissed him as, you know, many have said to him that he was anti-scientific because of that sermon. But, you know, that was, that was a misinterpretation. So, um, yeah. Um, he was a, but he was a phenomenal preacher during his time, a phenomenal preacher during his time, all right? All right, any questions on him? Mm 
Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move to a more, let's move to someone else you, you all probably have heard of. Uh, um, C.L. Franklin, the Reverend C.L. Franklin. Uh, he was one of my favorite preachers uh, when, I, when I started off in ministry. Uh, um, Reverend C.L. Franklin. He was born in Sunflower County, Mississippi. Uh, he lived among sharecroppers and listened to the blues. In fact, C.L. Franklin did not find a, um, he, he didn't see any difference between the secular and the sacred. Um, he was converted to faith at nine or 10, and he was ordained at age 17. He was, he was ordained young. He pastored in Memphis and Buffalo, New York. Uh, but subsequent, but he's most notably, he was most notably the pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and he was often called the man with the golden voice and the rabbi. And one of his most famous sermons, uh, though Franklin's sermons are so his sermons were extemporaneous which means he preached without notes um he selected a text he would consult commentaries he did his exegesis you know and he thought his notes through and then developed a topical outline his delivery involved spoken oration then he went into his hoop First tapping the intellect, then stroking the emotion. So C.L. Franklin's appeal was, hey, let me get you thinking first before I start hooping. You know, and, and people can learn from that. Because sometimes in preaching, we jump to the hoop <laughs> and, and not touch their mind. You, wanna, you don't want to just touch their emotion. You want to touch their mind. All right. All right. Now, one of his famous sermons, and I'm going to post this. I'm going I'm to send y'all this in your text messages. So I'm going to send you both versions. The eagle stir of her nest. If you have not heard that sermon, you should listen to it. So I'm, I'm going to send that to you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. The next preacher I want you to be familiar with is the Reverend Gardner C. Taylor. Now, um, this is the Reverend Gardner C. Taylor. Yeah. All right. He was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1918. He was the only child. Uh, he grew up in a Christian home, and 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 was was reared un, under the in the tradition of the Black Church. Uh, he attended Earl Ober, Oberlin Graduate School of Theology, and he answered his call to ministry after an automobile accident. Um, oh. For almost forty years, he was the pastor of the Concord Baptist Church in Brook of Christ in Brooklyn, New York, where he retired in 1990. And he has been affectionately called the Dean of the Black Pulpit. Now, one of his other, one of his sermons was in his own clothes. So I'm gonna post a lot of these sermons tonight. Oh, I'm gonna give them to y'all tonight. And I want you just to be inspired by these sermons. So I'm, I'm gonna share them with you. And, and, and let me also say this, I'm also going to share the, because I don't want it to seem like, because again, we I've only mentioned male preachers, uh, I'm going to send some female preachers too, so that way we can be, we can hear their voices as well. All right. Um, the next preacher, and the last one I want to know tonight is the Reverend Renita Weems. Mm -hmm. Um, 
This is her. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'm sorry. All right. She grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. She was she was told by her stepmother that the Lord had her had his hands on him, on her rather. Mm -hmm. He earned a doctorate in biblical studies with an emphasis in Hebrew Bible from Princeton Theological Seminary. And she also became an, uh, an elder in the African and Methodist and the AME Church. She's an author of a number of works, and she also served as she also serves uh, uh, served as co-pastor of the Ray of Hope Community Church in Nashville, Tennessee. These are individuals who have shaped preaching. They have shaped preaching. And so again, I want you to know that there are voices and I didn't get a chance to know all the voices. Uh, there's Otis Moss Jr. and Otis Moss III. There is um, uh, uh, Regina Stewart. There is, uh, there is, uh, Lord Jesus, there is, she just passed not too long ago. Um, but she was a trailblazer. There's Dr. Kimberly Credit that we gotta also know. Um, but there's so many voices that have influenced the pulpit. Black, at the end of this lecture, I want you to realize that black preaching has played a phenomenal role, you know, and it, and it deserves a priority in the life of the church, All right? But I must say this, preaching is in crisis because there are those who wanna lean strictly to the old way of preaching. Just, oh, well, let's just give them three points in a poem. Mm. And that's not always helpful. And so the goal of this class really is to, hey, how can we do better in our preaching? At the end of this class, you and I ought to become better in our preaching. If you've never done it before, you're going. my goal is to get your feet wet because I want you to become the very best in the field of preaching. All right. Um, we've had opportunity to see how preaching has developed through the church history. We're living in an era when church has lost much of, it, of the influence. Preaching has become boring and another exercise in religious talk. However, preaching is a creative act. All right, we will look at, at, other, style, at other styles in the third section of this class, paying attention to its usefulness in the African-American pulpit. However, we must regain a sense of the purpose of the pulpit. The black church's view on black preaching has been born out of suffering and hope. We have discussed the, in preaching, we see our suffering and the pains of life, but we've also proclaimed hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have learned through the stories of scripture that God is on the side of the oppressed. What makes black preaching black preaching? is that we're able to name our sorrow, but also able to proclaim hope through Jesus Christ and that God is on our side. All right. Now, I've come to the end of the lecture and you are going to get out early tonight. So you ought to be thankful that you're getting out an hour early tonight. Uh, perhaps that depends on how long you, uh, that depends on the discussion. Now, I will say this, since I'm giving you an hour early, I'm giving you an opportunity to start your reflection paper. That's due to me next Tuesday. So let's, so before then, but, but after you've heard this lecture, what do you feel are the the challenges? What do you feel are the challenges of the, that the African, that the 21st century pulpit faces? And how, you know, what are some of the challenges that we face in the pulpit today? Just based upon what you've heard, you know, do, do you see any challenges that we have in today's pulpit? So talk to me. 
Can I can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Last last week on your on your um lecture, mm -hmm. you talked about a lot of people are not coming back to the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why is that? Well, you know, a lot of people. So it's not like people are not going to come to church, but there are a lot of people that will not because some people have gotten so comfortable with being home. So, you know, there's some of my members I know for a fact, I ain't coming, a lot of, a lot of my members have come back, but a lot of them are like, I'm good. Um, Cause some of them feel still unsafe, you know? So many of them, there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be up in the air about coming to church. Um, and so we, we gotta be conscious of that, that a lot of our members are going to be online. And so wow. how do we minister to them, those that are online as well? You know, so our ministry can't just be about those who are in person. It's going to have to be about those that are online. So that's that's my theory about people. You know, there's going to be a lot of people that won't come back to the building. They're still going to be a part of the church. Right. They're just not going to be a part of the physical building because they, they, they see that there's another way that they can worship. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Yeah. Um, I have another one. And then sure. I want to sure. Okay. I, I live stream. I live stream. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I think for me, our praise and worship has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't see, it's, it's just, just like they're singing, you mm. know, and, and it's like they're going through the motions. Mm. So, I, you know, like I'm wondering why. Uh, well, part of that has been, part of that is that now our goal has been to be, to give a good production, you know, because now we have to, we have to think about, okay, who's watching and, and we want to, and we want to give, and, and nothing wrong with it, because I think we ought to give our very best, um, but sometimes in trying to become, give our very best, sometimes it gets to be rehearsed. Um, right. And again, I get, I see your point. Um, and and this, how to find that, find that balance. That's the challenge is really finding the balance, um, which is very challenging. I have to admit, you know, how's the challenge of having an authentic experience and yet given a good, excellent production, you know, um, that's, that's, and, and believe it or not, that's, that's not easy. There's a lot of decisions that have to be made within it. And, and there's no easy answer. Every church has to go with how, what best works for them. And so that's why sometimes it may seem like a production, uh, but it's because that a lot of churches are trying to give their very best. Um, and so I, I, one of the things I would say just, is just be caught. I want to caution you is just, hey, you know, at this moment, you know, they're, they're trying. Every church is trying to find their way in this because believe it or not, no church before before March of last year, no church ever been through that. Everybody was coming to church. We were enjoying church. Everything was all right. We were dancing and shouting and you have to worry about all that. Now we're online and people can easily turn you off and go to another church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally just turn you, can click you right off and go to another church. I'm going, I'm all right, I ain't going to my church today. I'm going to another church today. Right, right. That's a challenge. And so a lot of churches have to deal with that. And so it's it's taking patience. You know, we're all trying to get this right, trying to make it authentic, but also trying to make it excellent. That's that's really the challenge that a lot of churches are facing. So that's that's the best answer I could give in this moment. Every church is just trying to find the best way to give you both authenticity and excellence at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge even with pre-recording because I did pre-recording and I remember one time um, when I had came down with COVID and two weeks I had to be away from the church and I still did service, but it was, it was different. Like I was conducting church from home and I was like, I'm not in my pulpit. Oh God. And I had to use old videos and uh, it just, it wore me out. It wore me out. I'm going to say that uh, when it snowed a couple of times, 
I had to pre-record the sermon and then, you know, yeah, needless to say, it, it, it took me some getting used to. Now I'm kind of used to it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of I'm now used to it, but I'll say this, ain't nothing like lies, you know, and, and I do miss uh, for and all and I miss those in those moments of live worship. I, I really do. I, I really do. I miss those moments. Uh, I, I thank God for pre-recording because pre-recording has allowed me to do multiple services at times. So for Monday Thursday, uh, I had already recorded one sermon, was looking at another sermon, and was preaching, and, you know, and then and had and, and was looking at two different churches. So it was kind of cool. Um, but it's nothing like live, you know. Right. Like, nothing like live. I mean, but you know, right now, all of us are making the best of what God is, what what we're given. And I and I must say this: God has been good to us as a church, and the church has really grown and has really begun to step out of the boat. So that's the blessing of this moment. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? Questions, thoughts? Either I must be a good professor, y'all don't or, or. It just or, take it all in. Yeah. Just taking it all in. This is good. Mm -hmm. It is. Right. Especially for me, who, you know, I was raised up in a preaching background. And, um, my father, our pulpit was frequented by people like Dr. Harold Carter Sr. and Charles mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And my father often preached, he often preached for them. Wow. Um, so I was all exposed to that good preaching. Mm -hmm. At 56, going back to school, looking at the scientific part of preaching mm -hmm. has been challenging, but yet exciting for me. Yeah. That's the transparent moment. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a blessing. And I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Um, you know, I, I think about preachers like Dr. Charles Booth, who, you know, I was blessed to just after, before his passing, you know, he would review a lot of my manuscripts. I sent them to him weekly and, you know, and he reviewed them. And, you know, I, I, I don't think there was ever one he gave, he gave me criticism on, um, but just to be able to have had that connection. And then there's Dr. Jerry Carter. Um, and then there's Dr. Leslie Callahan. There are a lot of preachers that I've been just blessed. And preaching uh, is in good. Even though we're living in a challenging time in the pulpit, I still believe that there's good news. That, the, yeah. that, that black preaching is not in trouble. Black preaching is not gonna die. I don't, because again, there are still voices. There are yeah. still voices. Yeah, they're those crazy ones. <laughs> There's always going to be crazy ones. However, oh, the blessing is the crazies don't outweigh the good. Right, right. That's the blessing. We, we, we've, we've done a big journey tonight. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to end out here. I want you to, for the next, uh, next week, I, I need you to write me a two to three page uh, reflection. What did you learn from this lecture or from your reading? So you had some reading that, if you have not got a chance to do the readings, what you learned from the lecture? So um, what are some things you agree with? What are some things that are challenging you? I'll post the lecture on the, I'll post the, um, I'll post the lecture on, on the classroom. So you'll be able to see it again. And I'll also, I'll also post my notes so you can go back over it again. And um, if there's anything you wanted, if there's anything in addition to that, please let me know. But two to three pages, um, no more than two to three pages. Um, and then uh, just let me know what you learned. What, what, what are some ways you're going to grow? Um, and then how are you going to apply that? And then next week. 
we start you, you should this week you should start reading this book the certain sound of a trumpet uh that is by dr samuel d Witt proctor uh, d Witt proctor this is a classic text um and we're going to be walking through this book uh starting next week so the introduction chapters one and two um this is an excellent text so uh, yeah. Good. Is that the book I need to get? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. Certain sound of the trumpet. Who's uh, the buy again, please? Uh, Reverend S uh, Samuel D. Proctor. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. You can. You can. If you have Kindle, you can. I believe it's available for Kindle. I think mm -hmm. I have it on. I have it on Kindle. I also have it hardback. But either way, it's a text that you should be able to really um, dig into. And uh, we're going to have a real, I think we'll have a good time. Next week, we're going to start with the science of preparing the sermon. Now, um, the other thing, um, I'm going to need you all to go to Google Classroom. And there was one more assignment I needed you all to do. Um, and that was to select your scripture that you want to work on. So what I will probably do, I will more than likely send it to you in a text. And what you can do is in that text message, let me know what text you want to work on as, your, as you develop your sermon. So in a few minutes, as soon as I figure out where, how I can access it, I will send you all the scriptures that are available. Hey, do you prefer we just put it on the Google class? I think they are. They, I, they're up there, I believe. It's up there. So if you if you can, you can go. That would be more helpful. I was trying to make it convenient for you. But if you can do it that way, I'll be even oh, happy. When I, was, when I was listening to the sermon, I saw the yeah. different scriptures you had up there. Yeah. So yeah. select the, So just in the comment section, just comment, hey, this is the text I'm going to take. And it'll let me know, and we'll go from there. Just, just let me know what your text, what your text will be, and then um, I'll be adding some additional things. I'll add uh, how you can turn in your papers next week. I'll add a tab for that as well. But um, I'll, I'll add that. So tomorrow I'll be in my office all day. So I'll, I'll, I'll add that stuff. But I'll put my lecture up tonight, and uh, the, the notes up tonight. The lecture will probably be posted tomorrow. And then anything else, just let me, if I forget anything, text me and say, you forgot something and let me know what I forgot. Okay. All right. You all got any questions for me? I'm good. It all was right. good. It was good. Great. Great. All right. Great. Well, all right. Well, listen, you all have a good night. I guess now I can go watch MasterChef uh, or no, Hell's Kitchen. Uh, I, I'll go watch Hell's Kitchen. So uh, let's let's prepare to pray out before we do anything. Let's uh, let's pray out and then uh, go from there. So does somebody can somebody close us out in prayer? <laughs> I'm just gonna wait. <laughs> All right, Father, we bless you for this opportunity to um, share this time. We thank you for the desire and the zeal to uh, yes. learn and to study your word and to be better uh, preachers. We thank you for this, uh, Professor Reverend Eric Good. We thank you for this young Joshua that you have uh, gifted the kingdom. We ask so that you continue to uh, bless Wayland as they endeavor to reach out and to stretch and to build uh, better preachers. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless each of our congregations and bless our world, bless our communities, Lord. And in all that is done, we ask that your presence, your peace, and your power will rest, rule, and abide in us since now and forevermore. Those who love the Lord say amen. 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 All right. I'll see you next week. All right. All right. All righty. Have a good night. Have a good night. Good